and welcome to the Mark Levin Show. That, of course, is not the voice of the great one, but have no fear. It's Dan Bongino, your handy-dandy bullpen relief pitcher for the Mark Levin Show. They're bringing out the righty, the crafty veteran. I don't have a fastball anymore. Maybe a little bit of a knuckleball. Maybe a screwball sometimes. I'm sure the liberals would say that. Happy soon-to-be Thanksgiving, folks. Again, I am Dan Bongino, at the Bongino on Twitter. If you'd like to send comments, criticisms, whatever you got, I take them all. Please uh, keep the death threats to yourself. You know, they some, some of them get pretty weird. I had one guy uh, threaten to run me over one day and my kids. It was very uh, pleasant reading that. I was going to the gym and I thought, really? Are you that angry about what I just tweeted? So, yes, tweet me at the Bongino. Hey, I got a lot of material to cover today. Let me just lay out what I'd like to do. So it's already starting again with the the liberal crowd, the academia, you know, the the uh, this uh, sleuths in academia, the the biased media folks. It's already starting in the the bashing of Reaganomics. They're doing it for a reason. They're doing it because Trump is talking tax cuts, and they want to cut that off at the legs and kneecap it right away. So there's already this undercurrent of let's bash Reaganomics and get out in front of it. So I want to dispel and debunk some myths about Reaganomics during the show. I want to get to that. That's critical we discuss this. Because if you don't understand the difference between the horror show known as Obamanomics and what happened in the Reagan years, it's very difficult to argue with liberal Uncle Joe at Thanksgiving dinner. Because you know it's going to happen. You know it's going to happen. I also want to discuss this guilt by association thing. Where all of a sudden, if any, this is what's going to happen again for the next four years, in addition to rashing, uh, bashing, excuse me, Reaganomics, you're going to have, they, the liberal media is going to find some knucklehead in the middle of the country somewhere who no one's spoken to in 25 years who has a sign on his lawn that says, I am a, a grand wizard in the Ku Klux Klan, I voted Trump, and they're going to interview every one of these guys for the next four, potentially eight years. So I want to cut off at the knees this guilt by association, uh, guilt by association nonsense that the media is doing now, and show you how they don't apply any of those standards to liberals. They just make it up. But before I get to that stuff, by the way, are you sitting in traffic right now? Now listen, I know Mark has a pretty substantial audience. It's the day before Thanksgiving, so I know there's a lot of folks out there who are sitting either. Did you see the videos online and Facebook and everything on the 405 in uh, California and Los Angeles? Or the BQE in New York. It's literally like it's like a, a Star Wars lightsaber fight. It's a line on one side of red brake lights and a line on the other side of yellow, and and that's it. Looks like like a lightsaber fight. I've seen some videos from last night, from today. It's unbelievable the traffic. I don't get it. I don't understand why people travel. I get it, family and all, but take a few days off. Like leave on Monday or Tuesday. Leave the week before to avoid that. I can't do the travel thing. It's not my. Uh, it's not my bag of donuts. But I, one of the things, I, whenever I fill in for Mark, one of the things I like to do, and I got a couple of tweets about this today, is I love to debunk liberal, you know, the, the, how do you even describe it? Like liberal ideology, liberal talking points, because most of them are nonsense. And one of the things I say all the time is, you know, the why matters, why they do what they do. And, you know, when you go back to the early days of early progressive liberal thinking that had its foundation in a lot of what Marx had to say, you see that truth meant nothing to them. You know, the ends always justified the means. And the, the ends to them was always the accumulation of power. They need power, folks. Power is their thing. However they get there, lie, cheat, steal, it doesn't matter. So what I find fascinating is how the liberals will change their argument on any topic. It doesn't really matter what it is, depending on who's in office and how it benefits, uh, benefits them politically at the time. So I noticed these two things recently that happened. I don't know if you caught this. Number one is about the Electoral College, and secondly, on voter fraud. Have you seen the, the curveballs they've been throwing us? So pre-election, right, pre-election night, before the Trump victory and the down-ballot victories and what was a, an apocalyptic night for the Democratic Party out there, the liberals loved the Electoral College. Folks, it even had a name. It even had a name, a nickname. The name is the Electoral College. They called it the blue wall. The blue, doesn't that sound ominous? The blue wall. How Republicans were subject to uh, the demographic disaster in the coming decades, in the coming centuries. It was over. There would be no more Republicans. There would literally not be a Republican left in the entire country. It was a demographic time bomb. It 
was over, Johnny. Sweep the leg. Sweep the leg. For you Karate Kid fans out there, it was over. There, you would never sniff another Republican again. There was this growing Hispanic majority. The evil white people were going away. The white people were leaving. It was over. Republicans, were forget it. it ha they called it the blue wall. And what the blue wall was, was this cornucopia of states that Republicans hadn't won since 1984, some since 1988, that really gave the Democrats the electoral college numbers they needed before the election even happened. So the idea was that the Republicans were always starting for, you know, it was like you were fighting in a boxing match and one guy had brass knuckles in his glove and one guy didn't. Like you're fighting the same fight, but one guy always had an advantage. They loved it before the election. Ladies and gentlemen, again, to the liberals listening, libs, I listen, I know, I, I know facts are tough. I know liberals. I know these things are hard to hear. So try again, get the cotton, take it out of your ears for a moment. One, 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 left ear, take that out, right ear. Try to jam it in your mouth for a minute. Don't talk, just listen for a little bit here, okay? Before the election, they loved it. They thought this was the greatest thing in the world. Again, Google the blue wall. They thought this was great. The Electoral College was fantastic. Republicans, due to this demographic time bomb, they were screwed forever. This was wonderful. The media loved it. Nobody was complaining about the Electoral College before the election. But now, oh, my gosh, the whining. Have you heard it? Have you heard the whining? So Mrs. Clinton, it appears she's going to win the popular vote, which, by the way, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. It's not the game anybody's playing except for the Democrats. So it appears Mrs. Clinton's going to win the popular vote, which, again, doesn't even matter. The election's over. You know, I saw someone write today in a piece that, it's like, you know, the, the Yankees are playing the Mets. The game's over, but the Mets come out on the field again for batting practice. They're hitting a few home runs, and they wanted, hey, can you count those? Can you get, no, Guys, the game's over. The game ended two hours ago. No, no, we just hit six home runs in BP. The, the game's over. Great. Count the popular vote. Every vote should count towards the final tally. But it's not a popular vote election. The liberals are going wild right now. I have zero doubt. That you're in a car right now somewhere. Some, Mark has a huge audience. There's a good portion of this audience in a car, sitting in some traffic, listening to this show. You may be with liberal Uncle Tony right now in the car. Uh, there's someone, you're laughing. Someone in the car right now has a liberal Uncle Tony next to them who is about to tell them, just based on sheer numbers, right? Mark has millions of listeners. I'm just playing probabilities. There is a liberal Uncle Tony in a car right now who was just getting ready to argue that Hillary won the popular vote and the Electoral College thinks. That I have zero doubt that's happening right now as we speak. Probabilities on my side, right? So liberal Tony's wrong because that's not the game they're playing. And what I would ask liberal Uncle Tony, so t you can don't take your eyes off the road if you're driving, but say to liberal Uncle Tony now, you know, that's funny. I didn't hear you making this argument about the Electoral College before Election Day. Matter of fact, it even had the nickname. The nickname was the Blue Wall. It was this insurmountable. The Republicans were done. They were finished. The Blue Wall was so wonderful. Right around the holidays, we need to celebrate, celebrate the Blue Wall. But then they lose, and all of a sudden, yes, oh, we got to do something about that Electoral College. What a dumb system that, oh, man, we got to get rid of that. Hey, uh, Liberal Uncle Tony, I never heard you say that before. You never mentioned the blue wall before. Oh, yeah, right. That's just because we lost, and I don't really have any principles, and I make things up ex post facto just because I want to get power, and getting power to me means changing the rules depending on an outcome that suits me. Oh, thanks, liberal Uncle Tony. At least you're honest with everybody. Or liberal Uncle Bobby or Aunt May or whatever it may be. Folks, I can't explain this to you enough that liberalism, for those of you who've listened to me fill in for Mark before, again, it's a common theme here. I bring this up all the time. Now, liberalism is just a bumper sticker. It doesn't mean anything. They don't really stand for anything. They've changed their position on, on uh, you name it, I can tell you what they've changed the position on. Taxes, gay marriage, you name it. The only thing that, that's been like a sacrament to them and they never change is they're like in love with the idea of abortion. Like that's a sacrament to them. That's, I'll give you that. They've never changed on that. 
Any opportunity to, you know, to instill some pro-abortion agenda, they'll rock and roll with that. But they've changed their position on everything else because they do things that are politically expedient. And when the electoral college system suited them, and it was the, quote, blue wall, they were in love with it. It was the greatest thing ever. And now, all of a sudden, because you dropped a big, fat L for a loss in this election, you got smoked everywhere. You got smoked just about everywhere it mattered. Now, all of a sudden, we got to scrap that system. Forget, you know that blue wall stuff? That was all crap. Now we need to go back to a popular vote. Oh, okay. And then if they, if, here's the, here'll be the funny thing. Remember this show. Mark podcasts them all at marklevinshow.com, right? Remember this show. In four years, if Trump wins the popular vote and loses the electoral college in the net, you know, in the next election coming up, mark my words, they will change their mind. And they'll say, if the Electoral College, this thing, this thing rocks. The founders were genius, man. This was great. So, folks, i got to take a break. Before I go to I just want to leave you with this. If you're in the car with liberal Uncle Tony right now, you're getting ready to meet him. Understand this. At least you have your principles. Good conservatives out there stand for something. We don't change our position when it's politically expedient. If we lose a popular vote or we win a popular vote and we lose the Electoral College, we're not going to say scrap the Electoral College. We know why it matters. And after the other, on the other side of this break, I'm going to get to some of the reasons this stuff matters. I'm going to get to this voter fraud thing, too, because there's another curveball. They right. Liberals pre-election, right? Voter fraud. It's all crap. There's no voter fraud. Now, have you seen the headlines? Oh, my. There's, Wisconsin? Oh, they hacked the vote. Do you have any evidence of that? No, no, but I think they did. This is what liberals do. All right, I got to take a break. I'm Dan Bongino at the Bongino on Twitter. If you'd like to give us a call and join the show, 877 381 3811. Make sure you give Mark a follow on Twitter as well, at Mark Levin Show. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back to the Mark Levin Show. Dan Bongino, relief pitcher, in for the great one today, at the Bongino on Twitter. If you want to send me a tweet, comments, criticisms, again, whatever, we take them all. Already got some doozies. Already got a few libs firing bombs. I had mentioned voter fraud before the break. He's like, well, Republicans say voter fraud doesn't exist? What are you talking about? Like, no, that's the whole point. Like, Republicans have been saying voter fraud exists forever. That was the point before the break I was trying to make, how liberals don't stand for anything. Liberals are the ones who've always claimed, I'm not crazy, right, Mr. Producer? Voter fraud. Oh, there's no voter fraud. The heck you guys need voter ID for, idiots? There's no voter fraud, you conservatives. Bunch of kooks. Voter fraud. Despite the fact that cases of voter fraud have been documented everywhere, including in the state I used to live in, the state of Maryland, where the Democratic candidate for Congress in District 1, I'm not kidding, her uh, Wendy Rosen, who would won the Democratic primary in a slightly competitive district, voted twice in Florida and in Maryland. I, you look it up. No, that didn't happen. We're just making it up. So the point I was making before the break about how now the liberals are going crazy about the Electoral College, despite loving the Electoral College before the election, like I said, it even had a name, the Blue Wall. It had one of these fancy left, uh, left-leaning, left far-left uh, far names, these nicknames, the Blue Wall, insurmountable electoral, electoral College lead, the Blue Wall. We love this. You lost. Oh, I hate it. Now they hate it, and they change their mind. Because this is what liberals do. They're doing the same thing now with voter fraud. There's this story out there bubbling up. Have you seen it? Oh, we're going to challenge the results in Wisconsin. They're trying to raise money to challenge the Wisconsin results, saying this is hysterical, folks. This is their premise. I'm not kidding. I'm not making this up. You're, you, you know what these sto- When I see these stories on Twitter now that I think are silly, I have to look. I'm like, you know, everything that's happening on college campuses and the kookiness of the far left, like that may be real. So I saw this story today about them challenging the results because they, they think the uh, Wisconsin polls were hacked. And I'm like, oh, come on, that's The Onion, right? It's got to be a joke. You know, The Onion makes up these uh, these silly fake news stories. I'm like, this has to be fake news. No, it's real news. And it, here's the entire premise. The entire premise is that electronic uh, districts, voting districts, they're voting precincts that used – electronic machines versus paper ballots that Trump did significantly better. What? Oh, that's got to be a scandal. Oh, clearly someone hacked the machines. Despite the fact where <laughs> it's, 
I, I don't even want to say because it's so dumb that it, repeating it shows you what the liberals want you to believe. They they want you to like forego intelligence for a minute, drop your IQ thirty points, so you can believe the story. Despite the fact that the locations where the electronic machines were used were places where Trump was pretty much expected to do better than Hillary Clinton. So just so we're clear, your evidence of voter fraud is where Trump was expected to do better, he did. That's a genius theory, man. It reminds me of that line. Remember the, the Usual Suspects? You guys see that movie? That was a great movie. They're, they're interviewing Kevin Pollack. I think it was the guy. I always confuse him with Kevin Spacey. And they sit him down at the cops, and, and he's, he's criminal they've got for this big crime. And they're like, hey, listen, we can place you in Queens on the night of the robbery. He goes, I live in Queens. Did you figure that out yourself? Or you got a team of monkeys working around the clock. Like, this is, this is what that reminds me of. Like, so Donald Trump did better in districts he was supposed to do better. And this is your evidence for a massive electronic crime hack of a, of a presidential election. From the very same people, folks, keep in mind, the very same people who will swear on a monkey's uncle, they will swear that voter fraud doesn't exist. There's no such thing. This is my entire point. Liberals make this stuff up. They make this whole thing up. All right, after the break, I want to get into this. This is important. After the break, this is critical. I know I'm sarcastic a lot. I, you know, I try to keep it light, especially the day before Thanksgiving. But this whole thing with the GOP, conservatives, Trump, and white nationalists and racism, we're going to decimate this after the break because I'm getting tired of this. They One set of rules for us and another set of rules for the other team. And the list goes on and on and on and on. Of, of media types and people who have who have just painted us with the worst, most disgusting labels, but use a completely different set of rules when it comes to defending liberals. All right, and I'm Dan Bongino, in for the great one, at D. Bongino on Twitter. If you'd like to give us a call, 877-381-3811. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back to the Mark Levin Show. Dan Bongino, at the Bongino on Twitter, contributing editor over at Conservative Review. By the way, have you guys signed up, and ladies, for CRTV yet? You got to do it. Get out there. Please don't miss it. We got an unbelievable lineup over there. I work over there. Mark uh, is, is our editor-in-chief over there. CRTV.com. Can't beat it. 99 bucks for a year of commercial-free content. We've got – you may have heard of this guy we got on the show. May it. I don't, Rich, have you heard of this guy, Mark Levin? Yeah, <laughs> we got Levin. We got Malkin. Michelle Malkin. The great Michelle Malkin. The great Mark Stein. The great Steven Crowder. What a lineup, right? Commercial free content, 99 bucks. If you can use my last name as a promo code, by the way, Bongino, you get $10 off. You get it for $89. Go to CRTV.com, folks. You can't beat it. We got some surprises coming in the future, too, so uh, don't miss out. Get it while, get it while the getting's good. All right, so before the break, I was talking about, again, how liberals, they just don't stand for anything. They'll take a position, and they'll take an alternate position when either position benefits them politically. And this electoral college popular vote thing is their new topic du jour. So I want to get to something else, but I just want to wrap this up with the popular vote, too. Because, folks, this was not the game anybody was playing. These arguments about, oh, Mrs. Clinton won the popular vote, fine. I, you know what it reminds me of? She won the popular vote. Great. Nobody was playing that game. It, I, I really am in love with mixed martial arts. It's like the greatest thing ever. Seriously, it's like destroyed my entire body. I'll get to that in a minute, by the way. For those of you, a lot of people have been asking me about my stem cell procedure I had done, which was crazy, by the way. Like the greatest thing ever. But I love mixed martial arts. It's one thing me and Mark share in common outside of conservatism. He's a big fan of UFC and stuff, too. Someone said to me once when I was younger, I used to role with Matt Serra, the old uh, welterweight champ, in his place in, in Hempstead. And I remember I was leaving one night, and I ran into one of my friends. He asked me what I was doing because I was all sweaty. Was, you, you know, you're pretty nasty when you come out of these MMA gyms. And I said, you know, I, I was doing a little Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I'm a little mess right now. And he's like, oh, man. he's." I remember saying, that stuff is crap, man. You could just bite someone or kick them in the, mm, and, you know, you'd end the fight. And I'm like, Oh, yeah, but how does that change anything? Like, that's not the UFC rules, right? If we wanted to train people to be ear biters and cajones kickers, we could do that. It wouldn't be that difficult to do. But that's not what they do. The guys are training for a sport in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Yes, it does have some applicability if you, God forbid, get in a street fight, which you don't want to. But they're training for a sport. Those aren't the rules they're playing. 
In other words, if you walked in the UFC octagon and there were no rules and you could bite and bring in like a shank and liver shank someone, yes, it would be a totally different match. You, you win. You, the same people who are winning fights now would probably not win fights if you were allowed to bring a 4x4 four four into the ring like Hacksaw Jim Duggan from the WWE days. But those aren't the rules. That's not the game people in the octagon are playing. The game they're playing is no soccer kicks, no kicks in that area downstairs, no biting, no eye gouging. Those are the rules. So that's what people train for, men and women. Now, the same exact that now is that not logical? Lib, seriously, to our liberal listeners. Did I miss something there? Those were the rules that both teams agreed to, right? When I say both teams, I mean the constitutional rules that Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump both understood. They both understood the rules for the UFC match we call the presidency were that the popular vote doesn't matter. The electoral college tally matters. So given those set of rules, one team played the game right and won. You may not like it, the Trump team, and another team played the same game and lost. Don't you find it odd where the places Hillary Clinton competed the hardest, she got smoked. Folks, she competed. I, I live in Florida, okay? I live in Palm City, Florida, the greatest small town in America, I think, my humble opinion. But I am incredibly biased, right? You could not swing a dead cat without hitting a Hillary Clinton ad. It was, they were on all the time. She outspent Trump here by a factor of probably 22,000. All right, so slightly hyperbolic, but you get the point. She was on the air constantly. She wouldn't go away. She was down here all the time. Obama was down here. She was down here. Joe Biden was down here. Everybody who had a D in front of their name was down here campaigning for Hillary. And she lost. She lost because she understood the UFC rules before the UFC match. She understood there was no eye gouging or kicks downstairs. And that's the game Trump played, too. And she lost. She lost. Don't you find it strange, too, that she held this big uh, concert? Remember this? It was like the night before the election. Was it, I think it was Monday or Sunday. She had this huge concert in Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania. This concert because she knew uh, Pennsylvania was in play. The media didn't. The media said, forget it. Trump's got no shot at winning Pennsylvania because that was the media story at the time. She had John Bon Jovi, I think, was there. She had the boss, Medal of Freedom winner now, Bruce Springsteen, who was at the White House the other day. She had every Hollywood celebrity in the book up there. And I made the case, I think it was filling in for Mark, that Pennsylvania was in play because having been a former Secret Service agent, a concert like that probably took... I can't even tell you how many Secret Service agents to secure and staffers. So I made the case that if they were allocating those kinds of assets to a concert in Pennsylvania, they were in real trouble. I made that case before the election. Not that I'm trying to pat myself on the back. I'm just trying to make a point. She was fighting there for her very political life, and she lost. She lost a state the Republicans haven't won since, what is it, 88 or 84? She lost a state in Wisconsin we haven't won the Republican Party since 1984. So I don't understand, like, your argument that her popular vote victory is some sort of a mandate because she ran up the score in states no one was competing in makes no sense. It, it, it's illogical. It's illogical by, by the very definition of the word logic. The rules everybody agreed to dictated the, the flow and the strategy of the game. One team won using that strategy and another team lost. It's like libs, man. Get a grip. Can you even lose the right way? Like, gosh, do you, I, folks? Do you remember? Remember all those riots in the street in 2008 with Barack Obama? Remember the businesses that were burned down in in deep red states because people were so. Remember that? Don't you remember in Texas? You could see from the space shuttles, Texas was on fire. Remember Louisiana and Georgia? Oh, you don't remember that? Oh yeah, because it didn't happen. <laughs> you know, that's why you don't remember it. Because there was no such thing. Were Republicans PO'd? You're darn right. It got me my start in politics was the Barack Obama election, which motivated me to go out and get busy and, and do and not just talk. But, folks, I mean, credible people weren't out there going, this guy, you know, this is nonsense. Throw this election out. Let's start over. 
let's rip up the Constitution. I mean, can you even lose the right way? Liberals, what do you do right? Seriously, you screw up the economy, you screw up health care, you screw up public education, you even screw up the easy stuff. Like we gave you a trillion dollars in our tax money for a stimulus bill, which is a dis- by the way, which uh, that's a whole other what a disaster those are. But you can't even spend a trillion dollars right by your own predictions. Who was it? Christina Romer, one of Obama's advisors, economic advisors, who had said uh, one of them predicted, you know, uh, if we do this. Unemployment won't rise above this level if we do this stimulus package spending, the Obama stimulus, the porculus. And what happened? It never went below that level. And it didn't matter. Nobody cared. Where was the media? Oh, nowhere. Couldn't have cared any less. Folks, they just make stuff up. That is not the rules we're playing by. Just learn to lose the right way. Stop being a bunch of whiners. This is like an episode of the Peanuts. Like, we have to deal with you all the time. You know, you know and Republicans, we, we have this, we have, we make this mistake all the time. Like, we think the liberals care about taking the high road. And I'm not talking about all Democrats. I'm talking about the libs, the far left, the Looney Tunes. We always think like they're going to take the high road. They never take the high road. It's like Lucy with the football. Come on, Charlie Brown. This time I promise I'm not going to move the football. We always think, like, oh, after the election, they'll come around. They're not going to come around. They don't care. They'll just make up whatever story they need to make up to further some and advance some narrative. By the way, which segues nicely into what I want to talk about now, because this is an important topic. And uh, it, I wrote a piece of Conservative Review about this, about guilt by association. You know, I'm getting really darn tired of this, folks. Um, you know, the the... the why does the left have to use the, the, the racist label for everything all the time? Like, I get it. Like, you're going to just call the overwhelming number of Republicans who oppose you in the, the Congress, the state, uh, in state positions on judgeships, the presidency. I get it that you're going to use the R word once in a while. But does every single person who is not a Democrat, is everyone a racist? Are all the, I mean, does that even make logical sense? So they're at it again, and here's why I'm, I'm bringing this up. I was sitting at home the other day having a particularly uh, boring day. I hadn't had much to do, which isn't, you know, typical around me. I work at Conservative Review, so we don't do like a Monday to Friday. You know, I do a lot of writing and things like that. So I'm sitting at my, this, the, you know, the daddy chair. Do you all have that? Rich, do you have the daddy chair? You know the daddy chair, right? Rich has, <laughs> of course he does. I'm sitting in the daddy chair, right? My kids and my wife bought it. And I'm reading this article in the Washington Post. And it's a picture of uh, these three knuckleheads in, in D.C. at some, like, white nationalist kookadoodle meeting giving the Nazi salute. And I'm like, what? why are these people in the Washington Post again? You know, the, the irony, here's the irony of this whole thing, folks. I ran for Congress in a district in Maryland not too far from the actual Washington Washington Post, right? And I couldn't get in the paper, even though we almost won the election, right? I couldn't get in the paper at all. But all you have to do now, if you want to get in the Washington Post, folks, all you have to do is show up in front of a camera somewhere, give the Nazi salute, and mention the word Trump. You will be on the front page of the Washington Post tomorrow, and I guarantee you the 60 Minutes interview will happen, and someone will be like, uh, Mr. Trump. Uh, Joey Bag of Donuts was seen in the northwest corridor of Washington, D.C., giving a Nazi salute on a corner with a sign that says, Donald Trump is my Superman. Dis- are you going to disavow this right now? Have you met Joey Bag of Donuts? He donated to you. He donated four ninety nine six months ago to your campaign. You clearly know this guy, Mr. Trump. This is your guy. He is clearly your political. Are you going to dis? He is your strategist, right? Are you going to disavow Joey Bag of Donuts? He's there. He's on the front page of the Post. And it, keep in mind, by the way, the Washington Post, they go out and they find these idiots. They put them on the front page or they put them in the paper on the online edition. And they, they see no irony in this at all, by the way. In a society that thankfully has tried to minimize the impact of really stupid people like that, who are the people who give them the platform they want to go out and get new members to follow them? The Washington Post. 
Folks, I'm not kidding. I swear, if you go stand out there and you do anything that is and, and is really dumb, you will be in the Washington Post tomorrow and someone will ask Donald Trump to disavow. Well, now, now, though, these same rules don't apply with the lefties. No, no, no. And we get back to the break. I'm going to go through some examples here. I want some disavowing to start. I want it to start immediately. I want Obama to start doing some disavowing. I want some disavowing to start with Keith Ellison. I want a lot of people to start disavowing. The Southern Poverty Scam Center, otherwise known as the Southern Poverty Law Center, I want to hear disavowals tomorrow if those are the rules. If we're all guilty by association for Joey Bag of Donuts and his stupidity on the corner, then everybody's guilty, and I want disavowals on 60 Minutes tomorrow. I'm Dan Bongino, at D. Bongino on Twitter, Infomark. We'll be right back. Yes, yes. Welcome back. Dan Bongino, Mark uh, Levin, relief pitcher. The crafty righty coming out of the bullpen today. I am at D. Bongino on Twitter. Dan Bongino, contributing editor at Conservative Review, filling in for Mark. I'll be back with you on Friday. We'll have the best of tomorrow. Yeah, I always say it's always tough. You fill in for Mark. He is called uh, the Great One. For who gave him that name, by the way? Do you guys know who gave him the nickname, the Great One? That was Hannah. You <laughs> did that this day, Sean. I can say I totally see that. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, he'll uh, he'll be back with you on Monday. All right. So before the break, I was talking about this this guilt by association thing, and, and folks, you know it's true, and I know it's true. The media is so in the tank. It's almost like when we say it. It's so true that even the media is like, oh, okay, now you guys are whining. We've heard it. We're all biased. We get it. No, it's just absolutely true. The, here's my evidence, right? So these, these knuckleheads meet in D.C., as I said before the break. They put on some white nationalist meeting. They're all doing the, the Nazi salute. I mean, you might as well say, I'm an anti-Semitic moron loser. Please take my picture and put it in the paper. And all of a sudden, it's like, I see these stories on, on cable news. I'm running on the treadmill the other day. And it's 24-hour coverage of Trump is a racist. And here's your evidence. 200 losers met in D.C. to, uh, to talk about the uh, whatever. I don't even, white nationalism, is that what they're calling it now? And all of a sudden... That's it. Trump. This, these have to be Trump's guys. He, you don't even. He's probably never even met these people. So when you're a Republican, the media standard is what? That knuckleheads do really dumb things, even if you disavow them. You have nothing to do with them. You're responsible. But, but, but when you're on the left, all of a sudden the rules change. The media doesn't care at all. The media, outside of a few limited circumstances, you have this guy who Mark, and thank God Mark's been all over this, by the way. You have this guy, Keith Ellison, this congressman, running to be the DNC chair, who has made some of the most controversial statements himself that I've heard in eons from a congressman. And he has openly supported in the past Louis Farrakhan, a known anti-Semite. I mean, this isn't up for debate. This is a guy who has made statements about uh, about people who are Jewish. I can't even say on this show because it's a family-friendly show. This guy running to be the head of the Democratic Party right now has supported this guy. Where is the media stories? Where is the 24-hour cable coverage asking for disavowals? I demand you disavow this guy right now, immediately, repeatedly, over and over. You're not going to see it, folks, because the left is in love with identity politics. Now, don't miss this, because on the other side of the break, I'm going to explain the why. The why matters. Do you understand the left has nothing else if they can't label conservatives, libertarians, and Republicans, and frankly, even now, Reagan Democrats and now Trump Democrats in some cases. If they can't label you a racist, they have nothing else. And I'm going to explain to you why they do what they do, how they do it, and how you can fight back against this nonsense, ladies and gentlemen, because without it, the left has absolutely nothing. I'm Dan Bongino, at D. Bongino on Twitter, in for Mark. Make sure you give Mark a follow as well, at Mark Goodman Show. We'll be right back. 
All right, welcome back to the Mark Levin Show. Dan Bongino, contributing editor of our conservative review, at D. Bongino on Twitter. If you want to give me a follow, make sure you give Mark a follow as well, at Mark Levin Show, filling in for the great one. You know, Mr. Call Screener and I were talking during the break about mixed martial arts. He's like, hey, man, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm 28. Should I get into it? I'm like, yeah, brother, get into it. It's like the greatest thing ever. But it does bang you up pretty bad. I mean, I got into it when I was really young. I love it. It's like a passion of mine. I know Mark's into UFC stuff, too. <laughs> I got to get Mark into get into the, the mat room one day, roll a little bit. I, it's the greatest thing ever. It's an unbelievable exercise. But it did bang up my joints a lot. And I, um, I want to, just before Thanksgiving, seriously, give. Uh, I know I can be sarcastic a lot. And, you know, I, you, I, I use humor a lot in the show. But a very serious and heartfelt thank you to my, one of my doctors, at Dr. Mark Berman um, out in Beverly Hills. I, uh, I know he's a huge fan of Mark, too, but, you know, he uh, I was really banged up. I know Mr. Call Screener, I know Rich, I know, I'm always complaining on the show about my shoulders. My, I'm only 41, folks. I have really horrendous arthritis, and uh, he hooked me up, man, big time. I, I did this stem cell thing, and um, just changed my life. I was sitting in my bathroom one day, and my wife's like, why is your right arm straight all of a sudden? And I was just... You know, it's tough. I, I, all of you folks out there who are CrossFitters, you MMA people who are living with really serious arthritis, man, it hurts, and I was with you. But, um, yeah, so thank you. I mean it. You know, these we have the greatest health system in the world, despite Barack Obama trying to destroy it. And uh, thanks to people like uh, like him, I really mean it. The day before, it just hit me with Thanksgiving coming around because I'm always hurting. You know, I'm always doing the show. I'm always whining. My knees, 41. You think I'm 141 years old, you know? My knees hurt, my elbows, but I do. And it's really from the mixed martial arts. I used to never tap out. You got to tap out. Tap early, tap often. When, you, when the guy gets you in like uh, a triangle choke or an omoplata or an arm bar and your arm is bending in the wrong direction, just tap out, man. Tap out, please. All right. So before the break, I was, I was trying to just point out the massive, unbelievable balloon of liberal hypocrisy that's hanging over America right now. And it's the guilt by association thing. What are the rules? To media people who are listening, because I know there are some out there listening to us, left-leaning media folks, right-leaning media folks, decent journalists who try not to lean either way. Seriously, what are the rules with guilt by association? If a knucklehead somewhere, anywhere in America says some anti-Semitic, racist, um, you know, whatever, some Islamophobic comment or whatever it may be, and he's doing it to poke and prod people, and then he says, I'm a Trump supporter. Does every single person that voted for Trump, including Trump himself, do we have to disavow that guy? Is that the rule or not? Simple question, yes or no. You can answer up. I'm listening to all of you. To media people, yes or no. Is Trump, Trump supporters... Are they all responsible for everyone else's actions, even when you you have no means to control them at all? I cannot control some guy on a corner that does something really stupid, that does some overtly racist thing because he wants attention. What do you What do you want us to do? You want us to go out and 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 uh, you know triangle choke the guy and get arrested? I mean, what do you want us to do? People do and say dumb things all the time. The very essence of being fallible human beings is in a country of 330 million people, you're going to get a diversity and a continuum of stupidity and brilliance. You're going to get people at one end who are unbelievably brilliant. You're going to get people who are of average intelligence. And then you're going to get people who are just really dumb, who do really dumb things. You're going to get Ku Klux Klan members. You're going to get kooky nut jobs on the other end who scream, what do we want, dead cops, when do we want them now? You're going to get this kind of stuff. Now, just to be crystal clear so we all know, media people, are we responsible? Is the answer yes? If the answer is yes, then why aren't your people, and when media, when I say your people, I mean Democrats because that's who they are, why aren't your people responsible for the same thing? You have this guy, Keith Ellison, running to be in charge of the Democratic Party, running to be the chair of the DNC, who was stood by Louis Farrakhan, a known anti-Semite. I think he, like, mildly rebuked him in his book one time. Like, yeah, he's just a self-promoter. After years of saying, like, this guy was the, was the cat's meow. You have Barack Obama invites Al Sharpton to the White House. Al Sharpton, folks. 
did you really need to go through the litany of Sharptonisms again? Remember Heine Town? He was talking about Jewish people in New York City. Oh, you don't remember that one? Remember I'm talking about white crackers? Remember that one? Or crackers in his case? That's what he said. What? It was Barack Obama. He was in the White House, this guy. So why? Well, I don't understand. Like, if Mr. Media folks, Mr. Media man and woman out there and Mrs. Media woman out there, if the rules are that you're responsible for the stupid rhetoric of stupid people as long as they support you, then how is Obama not responsible for Al Sharpton, who he was invited to the White House? How? Keep in mind how I started all this, right? The knuckleheads in the Washington Post doing the Nazi salute, who now everybody in America wants Trump to disavow, were never invited to Trump Tower. I don't even think he knows these people. I, I'm not even, I don't, I, I'm almost positive he has never met any one of these people, and they are not in his inner circle. I don't know Trump. I've never met the guy personally, but I, I would bet you a million dollars right now he has no idea who these jokers are. He didn't, in, but Obama invited Sharpton to the White House. So why isn't 60 Minutes, why aren't the local papers in D.C., why isn't the Gray Lady, the New York Times, why aren't they asking Obama to disavow this stuff? Now, folks, just to be clear, so we need to be reasonable. Seriously. I'm not suggesting that that's an effective political strategy. I'm not suggesting the RNC or Trump should do that. I'm legitimately asking you a question, media people. What are the rules because it's very difficult to do this song and dance with you if we don't understand what the rules are or are those rules no if knuckleheads say things that are really stupid we'll attach them to the GOP and they should disavow it but when knuckleheads are invited to the White House who were on record saying really anti-semitic and racist things then they're not responsible at all the people in the White House for actually inviting it I mean, media people, how do you sleep with yourselves at night? I'm, I'm, I'm deadly serious about this. How do you sleep with yourselves at night, knowing that the rules only apply to the GOP, conservatives and libertarians? It doesn't end there, folks. Here, let me read you a headline. This is a doozy. This is for these, uh, the, the Southern Poverty Scam Center. Otherwise, you, by the way, you lose all credibility, media folks, whenever you have anyone from the Southern Poverty Scam Center, otherwise known as the Southern Poverty Law Center, whenever you have someone from this hate group on, you lose, instantaneously lose credibility, right? So the Southern Poverty Law Center, these guys put out this hate group list. And keep in mind, folks, they make this stuff up. They, the Family Research Council, the F Family <laughs> Research Council, by the way, I know people over there, full disclosure, these are God-fearing men and women over there who believe in crazy things, crazy things, like preserving human life. Oh, my God! You believe in preserving human life? Are you kidding? You are 100% a hate group. The Family Research Council, they believe in things like traditional marriage. <gasps> what? Uh, are you kidding me? Man, woman, that's insane. The Family Research Council believes in other crazy things, like there are actually men and women, and we don't have 672 genders. Holy Moses! Uh, how do these people allowed to, in a free country, even exist? So full of hate, there's men and women? And traditional mar men and women can marry? Oh, my Lord, this is unreal. So the Southern Poverty Scam Center declared the Family Research Council a hate group. Now, let me read to you a headline by our friend uh, Mary Catherine Hand. This is from a piece in 2013. After a domestic terrorist by the name of Floyd Corkins decided he was going to go to the Family Research Council with a bunch of Chick-fil-A sandwiches and a 100 rounds of ammunition and shoot the joint up. And he said, quote, he's going to smear the Chick-fil-A sandwiches over the faces of the people at the Family Research Council. Here's a quote from a piece she had in Hot Air. It says, domestic terrorist Floyd Corkins, who explained that he attacked the Family Research Council's headquarters because the Southern Poverty Law Center identified them as a, quote, hate group due to their traditional marriage views. Where's the disavowals? Not only are there no mass calls for disavowals of the Southern Poverty Scam Center, 
No such calls at all. They're on media channels as people treat these people seriously. The Southern Poverty Law Center all week was on these scam artists, fraud, fake, phony, faux human beings were on cable channels all week talking about the moron Nazi saluters in the Washington Post going, this, look, Trump, look, he's got to disavow. He's got to disavow. These are the same people who a domestic terrorist shot the joint up, the Family Research Council, quote, quoted them, their hate group status, and yet they're on TV talking about how other people should disavow <laughs> hate groups. What? Folks, are we living in, like, the Seinfeld episode? Remember the Seinfeld episode where George does everything backwards? Are we living in that episode? Are we seriously living in the world where the cable news channels are calling for Trump to disavow a bunch of idiots he's never met and are using as subject matter experts a group of people who were the inspiration for a domestic terrorist to go out and actually shoot up the Family Research Council? What the? Are we missing something? What planet does the media live on? Uranus? <laughs> I use that one intentionally. It's a family-friendly show. What planet do you live on? Am I missing something here, folks? You are being scammed. All right, I'm not done with this. I still got to get to the Reaganomics thing because they're setting up. But when we get back, I want to talk about the Gabby Giffords thing, too. Gabby Giffords was shot. That was Sarah Palin's fault. Now, of course, 100%. I got a headline from uh, some guy, Michael Daly, at the New York Daily News from 2011. This one's a doozy. Remember, because when something bad happens, even if the Republicans have never met the guy who does the bad thing or the woman, they are 100% responsible. But when something happens like Floyd Corkins shooting up the Family Research Council, everybody wipes their hands and walks away in the media. Oh, the Democrats cannot be held responsible or the Southern Poverty Scam Center. People are crazy and do crazy things. Oh, disgusting. Said the day before Thanksgiving. All right, folks, if you want to give us a call, liberals, you're welcome to. You know I always like to fight with you if you want to call in. 877-381-3811. We'll be right back. I'm Dan Bongino, at the Bongino on Twitter, contributing editor over at Conservative Review, and uh, relief pitcher for the great one, Mark Levin. Hey, I have to make a correction. I, I whenever, like, listen, when I screw up, unlike liberals, I have to, you know, you know, liberals don't matter. They'll screw up and they'll double down it. That was Jesse Jackson who used the term Jaime Town. Al Sharpton used various other colorful terms to describe the Jewish community in the United States that cannot be repeated on the air, not because the FCC, but because it is a family-friendly show. And I can't even, some of them, that, that, listen, Jaime Town's bad enough. Let's not double down on the far-left anti-Semitic junk and nonsense. But that's the point. I mean, that's it. Me correcting it makes it even worse. Like, Jesse Jackson celebrated at the DNC, no one goes, hey, folks at the Democratic National Convention, where he's at every single one, do you disavow Jesse Jackson? Nobody does. Nobody does. I mean, you had Robert Byrd was a Ku Klux Klan leader, and everybody loved him in the Democratic Party. He was the greatest thing ever. Disavow? You know, I was a Secret Service agent at his, I'm not kidding, at his funeral. I, I was there with Obama. I forget what I was doing that day. I think I was, I, I must have been the number one whip that day because I was holding the door. I have a picture of it from some Associated Press or Reuters guy or something. I was there. You, it was packed. It was packed. The guy was a Ku Klux Klan, like Grand Poobah or whatever their titles are. Grand Wizard or I don't even know. He was in the Ku Klux Klan. I was there. Bill Clinton was there. Barack Obama. It was packed. It was a packed house. It was full. It wasn't a seat in the house. I don't recall at the funeral, the media going, are you going to disavow this man who just died? Nobody did that. But if that was a Republican, oh, my Lord. Folks, again, these are facts. There's nothing controversial about what I'm saying except the fact that the left finds it controversial because many of you who are liberals likely are hearing this for the first time. You're like, what? What, really? There was a Democratic senator? who was an active member of the Ku Klux Klan, and Barack Obama spoke at his funeral? He was there. I was there. I saw it. I was there. Like, there, in these actual sphere of, I was there, on the ground. Leather-soled shoes hit the floor. It happened, folks. It happened. All right, let me squeeze in a call here. 
Uh, by the way, if you want to give us a call, 877-381-3811. Liberals are welcome, too. We have one so-called moderate on the line. We'll get to him soon. But let's go to Pete in Long Island, otherwise known as Long Island, where I uh, grew up. How you doing, Pete? Yeah. For us? Listen, I think people should take a look at the Democratic Party and take a look at what Mr. Khrushchev said in 1963 at the U.N., that they were going to walk in and take the country over without lifting a weapon. And how does he do it? Through education, divide and conquer. It's no longer the Democratic Party. It's the Commiecraft Party. And people should wake up and see it because they want to be the one big family. Individual families will not exist if they take this country over. They're you know, going to Pete, control everything. Your, your call was, was perfect. Because on the other side, of, and thanks for the call, Pete, but on the other side of this break, folks, that's exactly what I was going to segue into. You, if you don't understand, the the Democrats just don't do this to hurt your feelings. We all, we all get this, right? The Democrats don't just randomly call people racist for no reason. They're doing it for a reason, folks. There's a strategy. Identity politics has a really a tangible purpose. The Democrats have been doing this, as Pete said, and he was right, back into the days of, back when you go back to the days of Marx. They understood that if they put people in these boxes and they, they, they sicked people on each other, that the government could come in and be the peacemaker and the purveyor of all that's good in the end. But that's not it. That's not the only reason. They had to break any bond that wasn't a bond to the government and broke the bond of dependence. On the other side of the break, I'm going to get into this. It's critical you understand this. I'm Dan Bongino, at Bongino on Twitter, contributing editor at Conservative Review. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back to the Mark Levin Show. Dan Bongino, contributing editor over Conservative Review, at the Bongino on Twitter, filling in for Mark. I'll be back with you on Friday. we got a best of tomorrow. Mark will be back on Monday. Have no fear. You will not be in Mark Levin withdrawal. He'll be back to give you your fix. But I will fill in, coming out of the bullpen again. All right, so before the break, I was talking about the media. Well, what are the rules now? Are the rules with the media that... Any knucklehead who does anything stupid, says something racist, puts on a, a Hitler mustache and a swastika armband, he walks down the street, that every Republican in the country is now responsible for this guy, including Trump. Is, are those the rules? Are the rules now that knuckleheads, where if they profess su uh, support for a political party, the political party has to answer for this person no matter what? Is that the rule or is it not? Now, I would suggest to you that's absolutely absurd. There's no way you can control the behavior of people who choose to do really stupid things. But that's not what the media thinks. The media is out there right now. Every, every day it's a new Trump disavowal. Trump needs to disavow uh, you know, Joey Bag of Donuts, uh, you know, Tony Two Times, who was out in a, in a corner, in, in the street corner of Ozone Park. He was on the corner with a sign he drew with a crayon. He said that, I like the Ku Klux Klan. I voted for Trump. Trump, do you disavow him? This is the crap. <laughs> Folks, this isn't funny. Like, this is really happening. Like, any group of knuckleheads that gets together for the next four or potentially eight years, I'm telling you, anywhere in the United States that does something dumb, racist, whatever, xenophobic, uh, you put a phobe or an ism at the end. Any, there will be massive calls for the Republican Party and for Trump to disavow idiots, despite the fact that they have no relationship to these idiots at all. But again, they don't do any of this for the left. Keith Ellison, Barack Obama with Bill Ayers. Bill Ayers, a domestic terrorist. Bill Ayers, they knew each other. Nobody said, oh, you dis disavow immediately. Still, to this day, and even when Trump disavows him, he doesn't do it loud enough. Like, no, no, you really need to disavow. Uh, I just did. I just looked in the camera. And, and listen, folks, I'm not, a, I'm not a surrogate for the guy, okay? I endorsed Cruz. I endorsed Trump after he won the primary. I'm not a lackey for them. I don't work for them. I'm not in communication uh, with their staff. Uh, I, I'm not, I, I, no one feeds me talking points. I'm just telling you, like, the media has jumped the shark eons ago, and they just don't get it. They will do this forever. This guy, Trump, cannot win. He can't win. That's why I don't blame him for giving. He gave, when he gives the media the double barrel middle finger, I don't blame him at all. Why would you do otherwise? He can't win. If a guy puts on a bed sheet on his head 
and he stands out on a street corner somewhere. He will, someone will, will go on to CNN and go, there's a massive outbreak of violent crime due to Trump. Someone will do it, right? So There's no question about it. Trump will disavow it, and I don't know what they want him to do. They want him to, like, go out and, and, and what? Like, give the guy a right cross when he's not looking? Hey, media folks, watch. I'm going to mount this guy, and I'm going to ground and pound like Mark Coleman 1992 UFC style. You got that? I'm beat, Look at it. I'm beating this guy to death. Oh, he's not dead yet? Let me hit him again. I mean, what do you want the guy to do? What? I'm serious. What? What is your answer to this? They disavow. He didn't do it, disavow it strongly enough. Okay, I disavow it again. That's not loud enough. Oh, you want me to scream into the microphone? We have compressors here, so you're not going to hear it that loud. What do you want me to do? You want you want you want Trump to to, to scream at a press conference? No, I really at at, at six thousand decibels. What do you want the guy to do? They love to pin the blame on people. Yet again, when there's left-leaning groups who actually inspire violence, like the Southern Poverty Scam Center, again, Floyd Corkin shot up the Family Research Council because of things he read on the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center site that called the Family Research Council a hate group because they believe in crazy things like traditional marriage and preserving life. Oh, no. They really act. What radicals at the Family Research Council they are. Of course, I'm being sarcastic. So Floyd Corkins wanted to shot the place up and said he was inspired by the Southern Poverty Scam Center. And yet the media, no cries in the media. They still use these knuckleheads. They're still quoted in the paper. They still use, these people are an embarrassment. They still use them. So here's a question that I would get this. Remember the, the uh, tragic Gabby Gifford shooting? So this is a quote from Michael Daly, uh, New York Daily News, January 9, 2011. This is, a, this is an actual headline. I'm not making this up. Rep. Gabrielle Gifford's blood is on Sarah Palin's hands after putting crosshairs over her district. What? What? Are, is this guy serious? Now, the fact that this happened in 2011 doesn't make the point any different, folks. The point I'm trying to make is Sarah Palin had a pack. And full disclosure, she had supported me in some of my runs for office. There's nothing to do with me bringing this up, but you know, I, I want you to have all the information on like, the left that hides things all the time. She has a pack, and the pack had put crosshairs like bullseyes on a map of the United States over districts they were targeting. Something that's been done by marketers only since the beginning of time. Like, that's been used. Just put, like, bullseye. I mean, doesn't that goofy company Target use a bullseye? Oh, my God. They're suggesting people should what? Should, that you should go out and engage in homicidal activity? What are you kidding? I'm, listen, I'm no fan of Target after their transgender thing, but no one's going to suggest that their symbol is, like, g causing violence. You have to be an idiot. But Palin, they were targeting that district, Gabby Gifford's district. It's a competitive district. So some knucklehead, crazy psychopath, shows up and shoots this poor woman, and this crazy guy, Daly, writes a headline, Rep. Gabrielle Gifford's blood is on Sarah Palin's hands? Are you ins Seriously, are you insane? Are you nuts? This is what they do. This is what they do. The media and the left, they're all in cahoots. You know, Fred Siegel has this uh, book. I always forget. That. I think it's Revolt Against the Masses. But he talks about, you know, this, this iron triangle of the media, interest groups, and congressional committees, and how they all feed off each other to get a message out there. An interest group feeds information to a congressional committee. They hold the hearing that leaks to the media that something's going to happen at the hearing. And then the media picks up a soundbite from the hearing and makes this big story out of no story at all. Sarah Palin's hand, blood is on Sarah Palin's head. Are you serious? Are you crazy? This is what the left does. But again, when a guy actually quotes the Southern Poverty Scam Center, they're not responsible at all. Not one bit. You have, you have Black Lives Matter people who are out there actually screaming for the death of cops. Screaming for the death of cops. Pigs in a blanket, fry them like bacon. What do we want, dead cops? When do we want them now? You have these groups actually saying this, and the group is taken seriously by the Democrats. The Democratic Party. Didn't they get an invite to the White House, too? No calls for disavowal. Oh, disavowal. What did, like, one media outlet say, hey, do you guys, uh, what, how, Dems, how do you feel about that? Oh, it's bad. Can we move on and invite him to the White House now? This is insane. We're living in fantasy kookball land. We're living in b bizarro Superman world. You know, remember that one, right? 
Everybody's everything's upside down. This is what this is insane. What's happened in the media? They have totally discredited themselves. <sighs> All right, I'm going to get the identity politics thing in a minute too, because it's important why they do this. But I, I do have to take a call. Let's go to our friend George in the great island of Manhattan. George, how are you? What do you got for us? Dan, is it against FCC rules for you to take uh, phone calls? Is it? Uh, no, I'm taking your phone call now. <laughs> right, great. But first, the most important thing, I want to wish America a happy Thanksgiving. And this campaign the past 18 months did prove one thing. The American people were fed up and sick and tired of also the Republican establishment, especially when these guys come on TV like parrots, blaming unions, construction unions for the problems of the country. People got sick and tired at what about the Republican establishment's support of open borders, flooding the country, trade deals which sent good American jobs overseas and out of the country, driving a lot of places, especially in the Midwest, called the Rust Belt, driving good blue-collar jobs out and guys unemployed, people, hardworking people. What do you tell a 50-year-old guy who's married with kids to, after he loses his job, go back to college? It's nonsense. People got sick and tired of the Republican establishment blaming unions for everything. You know, in this area of the country, we had a double storm out Long Island got hit, parts of Brooklyn, South Brooklyn, got hit by that double storm four years, Sandy. You know who I saw out there volunteering to help people out? Construction workers. They were volunteering their time to help people get their houses back. Any kind of needs they needed was provided by them. And they also, a lot of these guys, some of them were out of work, some of them were losing their own homes, but they were out there volunteering. I didn't see any of these clowns on TV out there helping anybody. Right. Well, well George, can I just kind of correct something you said the, the republican one i'm not you know just google dan bongino divorces the establishment gop i mean I, i'm not an establishment gop guy i mean i have on my twitter account you know renegade republican it's for a reason i mean i'm not i don't know where you would, you would get that from but i think you're you're mischaracterizing the gop or the cons let me not say the gop the conservative position on unions um nobody i know is anti-union i come from a union family my brother is a local three electrician you know, my father was in a union. I'm, I'm not an anti. I'm, I come from a family of union workers. God bless. I've written posts on my Facebook account repeatedly every Labor Day, thanking the men and women who built this. I mean, literally built this great country. The problem the conservative movement has with labor interests, not union workers or workers in general, is we just believe people should have the right to join a union or not. I don't even see what's controversial about that. And we can't understand, you know, reasonable liberty-based conservatives who believe in the freedom of choice, why, if unions are so great, and I think they do a lot of good things, don't get me wrong, why you have to be forced to join it. So I think, I think you're mischaracterizing the Republican position. I think you are right, though. Let me just go to one. You are right. They, there are establishmentarians who have supported open borders, which I completely disagree with, and you're 100% right that there was a revolt in America. But I think you're really seriously mischaracterizing the Republican position on unions. No one I know in the movement is anti-union at all. They're anti-force. There's a big difference. No, let me correct you. They are totally anti-union, the Republican establishment. They would love to flood this country with cheap labor. That's their whole thing, to break the backbone of hard-working American people. And they pit each other against each other, saying union and non-union. These union guys... Wait. Especially the construction guys have really been hit hard the last 20 George, years. I get it, though. You're, we're, we're talking apples and oranges. I agree with you on those premises that cheap labor has been the goal of Chamber of Commerce types. For, you're 100% right. I'm not disagreeing. But you're saying that the Republicans are anti-union. I There are no anti-union credible conservatives. There's anti-force people. They don't want you. Why should you be forced to join a union? I don't understand. Why can't, If it's so great, why can't you just pick? Nobody's forcing anybody to join a union. No, 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 George, that's not right. Come on, let's be fair here. Let's not make stuff up. You know in states that are not right to work, in order to work in that shop, you have to be a union member. Don't tell me I'm wrong. But, but that would destroy the whole concept of a union if you had to go in the union. Wait, wait, union what would destroy the whole, that they actually had to compete for your business? So doesn't that defeat your, doesn't it defeat the premise of your call, that unions are so great that you have to be forced to join them?
We're not forcing people to join unions. What we're saying is we want to preserve unions, and we want to preserve what they what they provide to the hardworking people of this country. George, I'm not They're disagreeing with you. Listen to me. I'm not saying unions don't do good things. I'm not saying there aren't people who own businesses that grow rather large and lose touch with their workers. You should have to be able, you should have the ability to be represented and be represented by a competent agency, a union, or whatever. I, we're not. We're talking two different things. I'm asking you what you're saying. Republicans don't like unions. I'm telling you that's just not true. I am a Republican. I'm from a union family. I think unions do a lot of good things. I just don't think you should be forced to join it. I don't understand like why you're you you keep changing the conversation to something else. But wait, wait a minute. First of all, I'm not saying you personally. I'm talking about. The Republican establishment, with all these parrots you see on TV, they've always knocked you, unions. It's always been their rhetoric. I'm, if you're talking about forcing, we, unions force nobody to do anything. They're the most open-minded people when it comes to anything. But they're being driven out of business because they're flooding this country with cheap labor. New York City is doing it, right. and they're doing it to break the back of the construction right, well, unions in we, this country. George, listen, I agree with you. I, I got to run. Unfortunately, I got to take a break. I'd, I'd love to continue the conversation, but you know, we, we could go on all day. And I, I just disagree about. The, the, no one's. We just agree with force. We believe in liberty. Nobody's saying that I, a credible people I know that unions are a bad thing. They're saying if you should be able to pick. I don't even understand what's controversial about that. The left has gotten in so many people's heads that they're, they're pro-choice for everything but actual choice when you get to decide your own life. All right, folks, i got to take a break. I'm Dan Bongino, at the Bongino on Twitter. We'll be right back. <laughs> All right, welcome back to the Mark Levin Show. Dan Bongino, at the Bongino on Twitter, filling in for the great one. Be back with you on Friday. We've got the best of tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I had a caller before the break. We were talking about unions, right to work, and you know it was a great call. And I, I, I can't say this enough. I, I don't know how many times I have to say it to you know I'm a conservative, a conservatarian, I guess you, you know, to, to to steal a term from a couple other folks out there, libertarian leaning conservative. We are not anti-union. I don't know where that comes from. You're just believing the media hype. You know, yes, union workers built the country. Employees built this. Non-union workers built the country too. You're just anti. You know, being forced to do anything. We believe in liberty. We don't believe in anybody being forced to do anything. That's it. So, um, you know, claiming that the GOP is this mass movement of anti-union people is just not right. And, you know, I'm going to debunk some more. On the other side of the of the break, and it, please don't miss the next hour, folks, because you're going to be – you're getting ready right now to do the, uh, you know, the whole ritual tomorrow on Thanksgiving. We all sit around and gorge ourselves to death and – we all need gastric bypass surgery after this 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 unbelievable meal. I mean, I if you've ever seen me eat, I am a total slob. Like I can eat like no human being. I can probably eat the food of a of a of a silverback gorilla. It's pretty gross. But we're all going to sit around, and inevitably, I'm not suggesting this should happen. Everybody should kind of take a break a little bit from politics, take a deep breath, and enjoy your families. But I can't. Get away from the obvious, and the obvious is some. There is going to be some, you know, liberal Uncle Joe or liberal Uncle Tony who's going to start spouting off at the Thanksgiving table, of course, tomorrow, about how you know Reagan was the Antichrist. That they swear they saw six 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 on his neck one day. Um, how you know Trump is going to cut taxes, and of course that's going to lead to deficits. And I'm going to get debunk all that nonsense for you. And in the next hour of the show, I'm going to give you some ammunition to fight back because you know, listen, the, you're already dealing with. You know, you have you have one arm tied behind your back. They're fighting you with two hands. You're fighting with one. Their two hands are one is theirs and one is the media's. The media folks do this. The media feeds them this information. The accepted narrative among media types now is that, oh, the Reagan years, they were so horrible. They were so terrible. They were awful. The dead, it was due to tax cuts. None of that's true, folks. I'm going to debunk that. But right before, I just want to get to this before we go, before we go out in the break here. Identity politics. The reason... The Democrats do this, and the liberals do it, and the reason they've always done it is because they are taking the advice of the early Marxists who understood that allegiances to family and allegiances to God were competitors with the state. And when your values were going to be determined by an all-powerful state that was going to feed you, provide your health care, was going to educate your children, that competition for big R rights from God and rights you determined from your family were unnecessary competition, and those bonds had to be broken. They wanted you to identify with something else other than your family. We'll be right back.
All right, welcome back to the Mark Levin Show. Dan Bongino, contributing editor over at Conservative Review. Relief pitcher for the great one. Fill in it for Mark. I'll be back with you on Friday. I'm at the Bongino on Twitter. A lot of great calls. That union thing, really, Mr. Call Screener, that really set off a few <laughs> bells and whistles, huh? Sheesh. I'm looking at the call screen. We had a caller talking, a call before, and said that you know the Republican Party doesn't like unions, and we got into a little bit of a back and forth. And man, did that, uh, whew, called the phone just lit up. My whole point was, and I'll continue to say this, the Republican Party's not anti-union or anti-force. They just want people to be able to choose to join or not. I come from a union family. But I'll get to some of your calls. If you want to give us a call, 877-381-3811. Hey, have you signed up for CRTV yet? Commercial-free content. Have you heard the lineup, by the way? I work over there, Conservative Review, CRTV, Conservative Review TV. It's available at CRTV.com. We got someone you may have heard of. We got Mark Levin TV. He's going over to Conservative Review, CRTV. We got Steven Crowder of Louder with Crowder fame. We have Mark Stein. You've heard Mark Stein on the radio. You've got Michelle Malkin. Michelle Malkin's show is Michelle Malkin Investigates, where she's going to really – she she gets a new – I love her term, crap weasel. She goes and <laughs> exposes a new liberal crap weasel every week. So CRTV, it's available at CRTV.com. That's CRTV.com. Make sure you sign up. we got a lot of surprises ahead in the future. And uh, I work there. I love the place. Great group of people. Dan Horowitz, Gaston Mooney. Jen Taylor, we got Ricky Radcliffe, Beth, John, shout out to the whole team over there. You guys are great. Chris Pandolfo, who always beats me every week, by the way. Chris Pandolfo at Conservative Review writes these pieces, and they put out a, an analytics thing every week about who gets the most hits at the website. Mr. Producer, this kid beats me every week. He beats me every week. It's not fair. I feel like a Democrat. I'm a victim here. There's clearly some clickbait inequality going on here. No, he writes good stuff. I think last week I was four. I got. I want to be. I'm so competitive. I want to be number one. Hey, also a quick um, thank you on a very serious note. Tomorrow is Thanksgiving. To all the cops, military, Secret Service, FBI, law enforcement, intelligence people out there, many of you know me. I was a Secret Service agent in my prior life. I loved it. I thought it was the greatest job in the world. I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, but I just remember one year being up at Camp David on Thanksgiving. And keep in mind, I had lived in Maryland. I wasn't even far from home like our military people over in Af Afghanistan and Iraq and all over the world, you know, in the DMZ and in Germany and Landstuhl and, you know, in South Korea. I was up in Camp David, and I just remember standing a post in the back of the chow hall there and feeling like it was like the loneliest experience on earth. You know, and not a boo-hoo. I love my job. I mean it. But I say that. Not as a sob story, but to give a shout out to the people who don't get to be home right now. The men and women uh, aren't going to be home tomorrow. You know, families will be eating dinner and laughing, having a few drinks, eating some turkey. And there are men and women out there on the front lines all over the world, uh, whether it's, again, our military, our Secret Service guys, our cops out there answering radio runs for missing kids and thing like, things like that on Thanksgiving. A big, fat, hearty, juicy thank you to you all for doing everything you do. You know, you're the people that really matter, not these clowns in the protest movement out there, you know, trying to cause problems for all the cops out there in the street. So thanks for everything you do. So for everyone else who's going to Thanksgiving dinner and has that liberal Uncle Tony there, who's, by the way, preparing to drop a rhetorical bomb on you right now. Now, I just want to be clear. I'm not suggesting on a a wonderful holiday like Thanksgiving that you should start some kind of a political fight at the table God forbid. I'm not using his name in Maine. I mean, I mean it. That is definitely not what you should do. Enjoy your family. It was a really hostile election season. The primaries were rough. The general was uh, just the whole thing was just it left us all with battle scars. But having said that, you and I both know there's nothing liberals like more than to sit down at a nice family meal and throw out, you know, Reagan really sucked. Did I tell you that? And you're like, what? What? Pass the cranberries, you answer when Reagan sucked? Like, where did that come from? Can you pass the cranberry sauce? Reagan sucks. What? Uh, excuse me? Um, okay, the cranberries that bad? I mean, did I upset you? You know what's going to happen. Now, I am a passionate defender of what happened in the years of the Reagan economy, as is Mark. Mark worked for Ronald, uh, Ronald Reagan in the White House. I was very young at the time. Uh, gosh, I was born in 74, so I was just a, I was just a wee toddler. 
uh, when Reagan was the president. But I really am passionate about economics. And one of the things that's bothering me now is I'm seeing this, and I have some headlines here. I'm going to read you in a second. This this theme in the media already because they're trying to beat back these Trump tax cuts that are coming. Listen, they're going to propose tax cuts. Thank God. The Trump administration, the men and women up on the Hill, tax cuts are coming, Lib. so get ready for it. Now, whether they're going to pass or what degree they're going to be, I don't know. Only God knows that now. But they're coming, and I'm already seeing the mainstream media scream out there where they're all having a meltdown about these tax cuts. And in order to do it, they're using, they're trying to, you know, debunk Reaganomics, which is nonsense because you can't debunk facts. And, I mean, facts are facts. You know, facts don't really care how you feel about them. They're facts, right? So I'm seeing it already. So here's a... a, a I saw a piece by in Politico by a Brian Faylor. It was a short piece. And he, I, don't, I don't know this guy. I'm not knocking him. It's just, it, it all propagated myths about Reaganomics. And I saw another piece in The New Yorker by his, uh, John Cassidy guy. And here's a quote from the piece. And he's talking about the Trump tax cuts. He says, we know for sure, emphasis mine, we know for sure that Trump's tax cuts would greatly accentuate inequality. Now, so, folks, rather than reading a bunch of liberal headlines about the disastrous Trump tax cuts, how it's going to smash the economy, how Reagan tried this, this was terrible, I'm just going to go into some of the myths you're going to hear, and I'm going to knock them down because it's really easy to do, uh, because liberals just don't know what they're talking about when it comes to economics, folks. They've taken the facts vaccine over and over and over. They are vaccinated against data, common sense, facts. Is not, really, They will. you give them 2 plus 2 equals 4, they'll swear to you, would equal 76 if Barack Obama said it every single time. But if Reagan said it, it was a lie. If Reagan says two plus two equals four, they'll say check twice. Do you have a footnote on that? All right. So it accentuates inequality, according to John Cassidy's piece in The New Yorker. We've heard that. We've also heard that Reagan was terrible for the minority community. Remember that? Have you seen this stuff? I was watching. I'm not going to say which cable news channel, by the way. Just a quick backstory here. But they had this thing in the 80s. And I was watching this 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 thing about Reagan, this portion about Reagan, and you were like, "Did that what? Like, what era are you talking about? The eighties? That's not what happened. Like, the people were suffering, the rich got richer, and the poor got poorer, and minority communities were struggling." You're like, "Really? Like that happened?" I'm scratching my head, like, "Gosh, that's insane." He, things were so bad. Reagan won forty nine out of fifty states for reelection. That's incredible how that happened. So let me give you some numbers to slap down this nonsense right away. Folks, the myth that the rich got richer in the Reagan years and the poor got poorer is a myth. Here are the facts. The bottom 20% of earners, what we would call lower income categories, the bottom 20% of earners and the top 20% of earners, their incomes jump by the same percentage, folks. The same percentage. So Reagan comes into office, the tax rate is an absolutely outrageous 70%. The top marginal tax rate, 70%. He cuts the rate all the way down by the time he leaves office to 28%. So the myth out there, in order to, you know, because liberals want to debunk all the prosperity that happened in the Reagan years, is, oh, well, you know what, that, all that prosperity, that was only rich people. No, er, wrong. That's not what happened. People at the lower end of the income scale saw their income jump by the same percentage as the people who were at the upper end of the income uh, income scale. Again, folks, kind of an inconvenient fact if you're trying to propagate the myth that Reagan was just in it for the rich guy. Well, clearly no, because people at the bottom end of the income scale had their incomes jump as well. Kind of inconvenient. Oh, that one hurt? Oh, you didn't like that, Libs? Inconvenient? Didn't fit your story about how awful Reagan was? How tax cuts are so terrible because it's only going to benefit the evil rich people? Oh, you thought I was done. Oh, no, no, no. No, 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 no. Old Dan Bongino's got a lot more for you guys and ladies. Here's another one. Middle class incomes. Now, I'm going to play a little mental game here with you a minute. They'll tell you, oh, okay, all right, so whatever. People who were poor had incomes jump a little bit. The middle class definitely shrunk in the Reagan years. Oh, you're absolutely right. No, no, you are. The middle class did shrink. Middle class earners were about 55% of households in 1980. They were 51% in 1989. Oh, my gosh, the middle class shrunk. What, What did Reagan do? Did he steal their money? Gosh, the middle class shrunk. It got smaller. You know why it shrunk? 
because they moved into higher income categories, not lower income categories. That 4% difference is completely accounted for. I shouldn't say completely, almost completely accounted for by people in the middle class moving into higher income categories, not lower ones. Oh, you didn't hear that, Libs. Oh, you never heard that before? Oh, Reagan magically impoverished all kinds of poor people and middle class folks but was incredibly reelected with a 49 out of 50 state landslide like we haven't seen in, what, 50 years? Oh, what, 100 years? Who knows? Well, all these people were suffering, and yet they managed to reelect it. He won Maryland. He won California, New York. He won Hawaii. Hawaii. What kind of Republican wins Hawaii? Reagan did. The only state he lost was Minnesota. Ironically, um, he only lost it by 3,000 votes, and that's where Mondale was from. I mean, they gave the state to Mondale. So, folks, I just explained to you using facts, libs, facts, F-A-C-T-S, two S's if you're Joe Biden, facts that the middle class did shrink under Reagan because they got richer. <laughs> they made more money. That's a problem? That's a problem. Yeah, wow, well, that Reagan, man, he really screwed you. Your income went up. Oh, man. That's that's horrible. Get him out. Vote him out. Get him out of there. Can you impeach him? Can we impeach him? Uh, Poor Reagan. God rest his soul. Can you ex post facto? Can we impeach the guy? I mean, seriously? People who were poor got richer. People who were rich got richer. People who were in the middle class got richer. The facts are on our side if you believe in those inconvenient things like facts. Wait, I got more on this. Don't go anywhere. Because liberal Uncle Tony is going to tell you, yeah, oh, yeah, the economy was okay, but it was only for rich people. And you're going to throw this right back in liberal Uncle Tony's face and say, yeah, that's kind of funny because the facts don't comport with that. All right, folks, I'm Dan Bongino at the Bongino on Twitter. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back to the Mark Levin Show. Dan Bongino at the Bongino on Twitter filling in for the great one. I'll be back with you on Friday as well. Gosh, this union, I can't believe the, like that really sparked the entire audience. I brought. The, I had a caller before, folks. If, if you've been listening to the show, you know that if you, you just tuned in, we had a caller call in about unions, and it wound up going into a Republicans hate unions, which I totally disagree with. The phones have been like lit up on this topic, even though that's not what I've been talking about during the show. I've been talking about this, uh, you know, Trump and how the kooky media wants them like to disavow every idiot on the street corner with a stupid sign, and yet nobody asked the left to do the same thing. I even got tweets over the break about this. Oh, yeah, Trump has to disavow them. These people are connected to this guy and that guy and that guy. Yeah, keep in mind, if you respond back, okay, should Obama disavow Bill Ayers? No, no, he's cool. It's all good. It's all legit. It's all legit. Don't worry about it. But, yeah, the union thing just fired people up. I do have more on this Reaganomics thing, too, though, because you're already hearing it. Liberal Uncle Tony, Trump's proposing taxes. It's like, what, do you want to go back to the Reagan years? Oh, uh, yeah, oh, I do. 6% growth in 1984, 5% in 85, 4% in 86. Yeah, I'll take that. Yeah, in contrast to what, the Obama years? 2%, less than 2%. Do you know, this is crazy, folks, in a bad way. Crazy, like, you know, the, the, the remember the, the Indian guy from One Who Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest? He, poor guy, he couldn't talk ever. That's a great book. But who wrote, was that Ken Kessie who wrote that book? I read that book in high school. I loved that book. Did he ever write another book after that? Tweet me at the Bongino. I, I'm serious. Did he ever get? I, I'm not sure if it was Kessie, but did he ever? I think that might have been it. But the Reaganomics thing, this is serious because they're going to. You're going to have someone who's going to want to argue with you about the basic tenets of what the Reagan years were like, acting as if what happened didn't really happen. The guy won in a landslide because the economy was rocking and rolling. What do you think it was? Because he hiked taxes? No, he didn't. Well, I'll get to that in a second. That's another liberal. Bit. But let's take a call. 877-381-3811 if you want to join us. Let's go to Greg, who's been holding for a bit. Greg, you're on with Dan Bongino. What do you got for us? Uh, good evening. Well, having gotten into college in 79, I, I do know a couple facts for sure. 1980, we were the largest creditor nation in the world. 1988, we were the largest debtor nation in the world. Our neighbors okay. to the west of New Jersey, Pennsylvania, lost over a million manufacturing jobs. The 80s is when the Rust Belt became the Rust Belt. I was traveling as an IT Greg, guy. hold on. Can we take one point at a time? Because you said a lot there. That's fascinating because the Rust Belt voted overwhelmingly for Reagan. Was it that bad? Were they, or were they all on the were – they, were, they were they smoking peyote? What happened? No, their, their, menu, their, their plants were being closed and moved, moving overseas. Oh, so wait. Let me, let me just – I'm trying to understand your premise. Hold on. 
I want to give you the mic, but I want to understand what you're saying, because you, you, I know what you were going to do. You're just going to fire off a bunch of stuff. So what you're saying is your premise, and if I'm wrong, correct me. Reagan was so bad for the Rust Belt that all the jobs were lost. Is that your premise? I traveled in those days a week to every different city setting up new IT stuff. I saw plants closing all, all Okay, okay, but why did those people then vote for Reagan? You got me. Oh, what, were, they all, were they all stupid? They, they even have a name. They're called Reagan Democrats. And keep in mind, uh, Greg, he didn't win in a squeaker. And another thing, the debtor-to-creditor nation, well, yeah, you are correct. I will concede that point. We One, we were not a – we had a national debt when Reagan took office, and we had a national debt when he left office. So you're not exactly accurate by saying that. The national debt did grow in the Reagan years. You are correct. Point conceded because it's a fact. But do you know why the national debt grew? What is your, what's your what's your uh, hypothesis on why that happened? In, incredible amounts of government spending in eighty one and eighty two, and then the whole country living on credit cards. That's that's a fact. Also, for, if you're for your uncle Tony at the dinner table, read something called the Powell Memo. Are you familiar with that? Wait, wait. Well, let's go back. Forget that a second. Let's go back to your initial point there, because yes, you mean it's not the country's credit cards that did it, though, Greg. It was government spending. It was not the Reagan tax cuts that did that. The Reagan tax cuts did not cost the government a dime. It was the fact that we spent a lot of money. It wasn't all Reagan's fault, by the way. It was Tip O'Neill who was pushing for big budgets, and you know Reagan signed them. I'm not, I don't want to, but that, that's you know it, it was government. You understand that, right? Like government spending was the problem. It wasn't the taxes, correct? That's when the infrastructure was started to be neglected because money wasn't being pushed down to the states and the counties. Now they had to come up with the money which have come from the New Deal and the Great Society. I, I, I need to ask you a question. I've never heard you before. I'm just driving home from work. Yeah. You're a conservative, right? Yeah, you got to make it quick. We only have about 15 seconds. Okay, 150 years ago, the conservatives were the slave owners, the liberals were the abolitionists. 250 years ago, the conservatives were who? The Tories. The liberals were the founding fathers. The Tory party, the conservatives... Are still All right, Greg, got to let you go. Sorry, that's simply not correct. Uh, you know, you're just, again, saying stuff to be inflammatory. And I don't want to listen to it. So I'll see you all on the other side of the break. All right, welcome back to the Mark Levin Show. Dan Bongino, contributing editor over at Conservative Review, at D. Bongino on Twitter. Make sure you give Mark a follow as well, at Mark Levin Show. Filling in for the great one. So I've been debunking all these liberal nonsensical theories about tax cuts. You're seeing it now, like the liberal media, academia, triumvirate there. They're already sold in the idea that the Trump tax cuts are somehow pending tax cuts. It's not even in office yet, but proposals, we should say, are going to melt down the economy. And watch, watch, watch. You're going to see it. You're going to see op-eds. You're going to see Bartlett reappearing. You're going to see all these people writing op-eds about how the Reagan years were so terrible and the Reagan tax cuts decimated the economy. You're going to see all of these talking heads, you know, some of them who turned into total hacks in their old age, who were in the Reagan administration, some of them, and they're going to come out and say, oh, the Reagan years were so bad. So bad, as if everybody in the country was delusional when they voted for this guy in the largest electoral landslide in modern American history to be reelected. One of the memes you're seeing reappear, and I just quoted a, uh, a line before from a John Cassidy piece in The New Yorker. It says, we know for sure that Trump's tax cuts would greatly accentuate inequality. Oh, okay. So I debunked that before the break, showing how the bottom 20% of earners and the top 20% of earners, their incomes grew by the same percentage. Uh, how exactly does that say for sure that it accentuated inequality? I, I don't understand. So people who were poor got richer, and people who were rich got richer, and that made inequality worse? Uh, uh, huh? Come again? Did I miss something? Beam me up, Scotty? One of the other things you're going to hear, and trust me, folks, the Democrats are married to identity politics. If they cannot call you a racist or an ist or a phobe or something, if they can't do it, they don't have an argument. So they are somehow going to say that tax cuts are, mark my words, that they are somehow racist. And they're going to say, this is just going to benefit the rich people. It's going to decimate minority communities, just like what happened in the Reagan years. It's going to happen by some liberal uncle of yours at Thanksgiving dinner. I'm telling you. Well, here's what really happened. Are you interested in the facts, even remotely? The black middle class expanded by one-third in the Reagan years, from 3.6 million to 4.8 million. Oh, 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 that hurt. 
hurts. Yeah. Yeah, that one stings a little bit. Reagan was so awful for black Americans that the black middle class expanded by a third. Oh, oh, right, left, hook, uppercut, body shot. How do I have a... Really? So the Reagan economy was so bad that the black middle class expanded by a third. If that's your definition of bad, give us some more of that, please. We'll take some more. Here's another one. By the way, in contrast to the Barack Obama administration, which has been an utter disaster for black Americans, right? Black unemployment in the Reagan years fell from 19.5% to 11.4%. Oh, oh, you never heard that one, Libs? Oh, what, you're watching cable news one day, one of your Lib channels, and they told you how Reagan, oh, he was terrible for black America, and you just sucked it up, right? <sighs> You loved it. It was great. Yes, it had to be true. Oh, you didn't hear that, though. Black unemployment dropped 19.5 to 11.4. Get my calculator. Yes, 19.5 greater than 11.4. Ooh, yeah, that one really sucks, right? That doesn't fit the narrative. What are you going to do now? Oh, you need some more. Oh, you want another one? Black-owned businesses. Oh. Grew 7.9% from 1982, 7.9% annually from 1982 to 1987. In case you hadn't heard, Reagan was the president in those years. 8% from 82 to 87? Whoa! Really? 8%? You haven't heard that? Oh, gosh, that stings. Yeah, Libs. Your argument's kind of falling apart. You know, on a serious note, no, I use sarcasm a lot. I have to. I, I Because I, it's really difficult. You know, they say, I, I heard once, and this is the true, I think one of the truest things I've ever heard in my young, you know, 41 years on this great planet, soon to be 42. My birthday's coming up, folks. You wish me a happy birthday, December 4th. Um, I'm going to be 42. But I heard once that there are two kinds of people that they see the world differently than everyone else. The super rich and people who are super political. And you know what? I can't speak for the super rich component of it, but I can certainly speak for the super political. I am a very, very political guy. I am obsessed with Friedman, Schumpeter, Austrian school economics, libertarian ideology. I'm obs literally obsessed. Like I can't stop reading it. I, I, I'm, I will sit all day, it drives my family crazy sometimes, on my smartphone reading Everything from any website I can get my mitts on from Cato to Conservative Review. And one of the things that they write about is super political people do see the world differently. Because you learn to deconstruct myth from fact. You know, I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a huge fan of Pearl Jam anymore. I used to be growing up because they've taken this crazy, like, far left bent. But they have a they have a song, and it, one of the lines is in the song is and they're talking about growing up is, you know, when you trade magic for fact, there's no trade backs. And, you know, when you really start digging into politics and you start to really understand what's going on, please understand there's no trade backs ever. You start to understand that things you accepted as fact were absolute lies. The fact that Reagan hurt the middle class, hurt middle class Americans, that's just totally, completely, fundamentally untrue. And keep in mind, I'm a conservative. I'm willing to acknowledge, unlike, you know, and, and Mark would do this too. Mark's not going to lie to you about the Reagan years. He worked for Reagan. Mark loves Reagan. So do I. But no one's going to say Reagan was perfect. There was a lot of spending in the Reagan years. It wasn't pushed by Reagan. He wanted to shrink uh, the, the federal budget. Tip O'Neill pushed against him. But I'm not going to tell you it didn't happen. But I'm willing to concede certain facts. I'm willing to concede there were some things that happened in the Bill Clinton years that weren't horrible. There was some level of control over government spending with the Newt Gingrich Congress. I'm not going to play the liberal game and lie to you about easily researchable facts just because it makes an easy political point. All Democrats bad, all Republicans good. I'm not going to do that. My point is, though, when you get super political like me, you learn to uncover the fact that very, almost nothing the liberal intelligentsia tells you about economics is true. I'm dead serious, folks. There is so, I'm not talking about all Democrats. I'm talking about liberals. Almost nothing they've told you is true. When you shake off the fog, you're like, oh, my gosh. Like, Everything. Like, the world is overpopulated. Remember that? You're like, really? That's a liberal talking point. The world is so overpopulated. You're like, really? That's amazing. I heard that in college. 
I remember one day reading a statistic that you could fit every single person in the world in the state of Texas with like the equivalent floor space of an apartment in Paris. And I was like, wow, that doesn't sound so overpopulated to me. Was I lied to again? And as I started to really dig into politics, all like really, it was like a light came on. It wasn't one road to Damascus moment. It was just many. Where you're like, gosh, they were lying about overpopulation. They were lying about Reagan. They were lying about the Republican Party. And their, the Republican Party has been the racist party forever. Really? They have been? Are you sure about that? Because I, I checked and somewhere I found that it was the Republican Party who was pushing civil rights legislation. Oh, oh, you never heard that. Oh, that stings, doesn't it? Oh, it was the Southern Democrats who were pushing for to keep Jim Crow. Was, oh, oh, you never heard about the proud Republican Party history of combating a segregated America. You never heard that in school. You heard the you know, there wasn't there a plaque somewhere in school that Abraham Lincoln was a Democrat. Oh, really? He was a Democrat. That's amazing. Folks, now listen, I get it. I'm not going to say there aren't knuckleheads or Republicans or knuckleheads who are Democrats. But the lies are going to continue. Trump has these tax policies out there, along with another. These are not policies he invented. I'm sure he wouldn't take credit for them either. Tax cuts have been around, you know, for with conservative economics for a long time. But you're already seeing the lies, and liberals suck it up. They do no homework at all. Here's another one. Another lie that you should never, ever accept is true because it's just made up, folks. I have to unlock my phone. I keep. I have so many papers. I, if you saw my little studio here, I have an iPad to my right with an atomic clock on, so we hit the brakes. I have a computer with the call screen. I have one note to thank the cops, so I didn't want to forget, and the military and the Secret Service guys. I just got a text from Ron DeSantis, by the way. Congrats to Ron DeSantis, congressman down here. He just had a kid with his wonderful wife, Casey, another daughter. So congrats, Ron. He just thanked me for for congratulating him. So good for Ron. He's a good man. But I got stuff all over the place, and I don't have even any more room left to take notes on stuff. So I have stuff on my smartphone, and your smartphone after five minutes beams down. But another myth. I got it back up. Don't worry. Reagan, the tax cuts, oh, they caused massive deficits. The government lost boatloads of money. You've heard this one, right? Folks, surely you've heard this from liberal Uncle Tony. Surely you've heard it from uh, Politico, otherwise known as mm, Bull Blankico. Bull, you can fill in the rest. The Washington Post, I'm sure Dana Milbanks told you this once or twice. The Reagan tax cuts, oh, they led to these massive deficits. They did? Oh, well, let's go. Let's see. Taxpolicycenter.org. Here's the tax revenue by year. Let's do this little thing called homework. Liberals, you may need a hashtag for this. Let's do hashtag homework. So 1980, Ronald Reagan gets into office. The tax revenue for the United States government taken in $517.1 billion. Reagan starts vigorously cutting taxes, that rapacious capitalist that he was. So surely if the liberal myth that the Reagan tax cuts caused massive deficits, surely the government lost money after those tax cuts. Well, let's go to 1981. Oh, 599.3 billion. Oh, how did that happen? It went up. 1982, 617 billion. Ooh, 617? It went up again. Oh my gosh. Let's skip ahead a few years. Let's go to 1985. Surely, surely the government was struggling for tax revenue due to those terrible tax cuts. So just remember, Reagan gets into office in 1980. Tax revenue is 517.1 billion. 1985, 734 billion. Oh! Oh, how did that happen, Libs? Liberal Uncle Tony, you missed that one? So Reagan cut taxes and tax revenue went up. He cuts taxes again in 1986. Surely, surely the bottom fell out on this one, folks. So we get to 1987 after another big tax cut. What's the tax revenue of the government? $854.3 billion. Oh, Libs. Oh, that smells. Yeah, your argument really stinks. 
stinks like a bag of dog waste left out on the corner for a little bit too long. Doesn't sound like to me the tax cuts cost the government a lot of money. Let's jump ahead to when Reagan leaves office. So he gets in office, $517 billion in taxes. 1989, Ronald Reagan's out of office, engages in a massive tax-cutting regime, which puts more money in your pocket and grows the economy, and the tax revenue to the government is $991.1 billion. What's the lesson for our liberal friends if they take the cotton out of their ears? The greatest irony of conservative economic theory is that conservative economics even works for kooky liberals because even the government makes more money when the economy grows. Chew on that one for a little while. I'm Dan Bongino. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back, folks. Dan Bongino at D Bongino on Twitter, filling in for the great one. Make sure you give Mark a follow, too, at Mark Levin Show. Thanks for all the tweets during the show, by the way. I mean, it, Mark really does have a That's why I love doing this. I was actually talking to Rich and, and Charles before the show, and I was saying how much I really enjoy doing this show because Mark, there's nothing you can ask Mark's audience they don't have an answer for. I ask these, like, random questions during the show because that's just how my mind works. I have, I'm serious. I'm not making this up. I have, like, a subclinical ADHD. <laughs> I do. These thoughts just pop in my head, and... I had this thought about the book One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and about Ken Kessie, and I got about 50 tweets about Ken Kessie, where he lives. It's just a great audience. It really is. You guys and ladies out there are amazing. Uh, speaking of that, I do. I want to get to a call, because this guy's been holding forever, and uh, I really appreciate it. Let's go to Doug in uh, St. Cloud, Minnesota. Doug, yeah. thank you so much. How are you doing? Good, man. Thanks for holding. Happy Thanksgiving. You too, brother. And, I yeah. was a chief union steward back in the 70s, early 80s. Yeah. And I understand some of what this gentleman was saying earlier, but he has to keep in mind that NAFTA was passed by a Democrat, and a lot of things changed after that was passed. Fast forward to 2004, Barack Obama era. Open borders, let everybody in. Not only the union people lost jobs, regular people lost jobs. So it, it involves, you know, it involves everybody. Yeah. And also, you've got, uh, you've got people working that they said they won't do things that, you know, Americans just won't do this kind of work. Well, oh, like, Doug, I, I, I can't, I, unfortunately, we're, we're bumping up against the end of the show in a minute, but I just, let me tell you that I, I, I'm not an anti-NAFTA guy. I know that's probably that may surprise a lot of the listeners. I'm not saying it was the best worded trade deal ever, um, but the the economic data it listen it caused some dislocation and hardship. There's no doubt about that. I'm not trying to run away from that, but the economic data on it is is pretty conclusive. That collectively speaking, it was it was a net benefit, not a net loss. For the United States, and I, I again, I know a lot of people that that's like, gosh, you can't say that. People will go crazy, but uh, I only do, you know, facts. So I appreciate the call, though, Doug, and thank you for holding. Um, I, I wish I could have gotten more calls on the show, but there's so much to you know squeeze in. Hey, one last point for liberal Uncle Tony about the Reaganomics era, because you are going to hear this from people. They're going to say, "Well, Trump wants to cut taxes. We want to get back to the Reagan era." You know, Reagan, by the way, Reagan, he only did well because Reagan raised some taxes. And he did, folks. Again, I don't do lies here. I do reality. Reagan did sign a bill which hiked the capital gains tax. The reason right now is beyond the scope of the show because we have limited time. But he wanted the income tax and the capital gains tax to be the same for allocation and arbitrage reasons, that kind of a thing. So he hiked it from 20 to 28 percent. So any of your kooky liberal friends, though, that tell you that the tax income, that the income to the government that doubled in the Reagan era, that didn't go, that was because of the capital gains tax hike. Wrong. That's a big buzzer. Eh, you're absolutely incorrect. Reagan hiked the tax, the capital gain tax, from 20 to 28 percent. He didn't want to do it. He was forced into it by the Democrats in, in Congress. The capital gains tax revenue of the government dropped, folks, 52 billion to 39 billion. So don't believe the nonsense from the liberal left that, oh, the tax revenue to the government only doubled, even though Reagan cut taxes because he hiked some taxes, too. No, the taxes he hiked cost us money. Oh, you never heard that one either? What, your, your liberal social studies teacher never told you that? Crazy, folks. 
All right, hey, thanks again for everyone who listened. I really appreciate it. Thanks to the callers. If you want to go pick up my book, if I can give a shameless plug, it's called The Fight, The Secret Service Agents Inside Account, Security Failings, and the Political Machine. Makes a good holiday gift along with Mark's books. I'll talk to you all on Friday. Thanks again for tuning in. See you soon.